Good. So many people today. Yeah. I can only disappoint. Okay. Maybe I should ask one of you to come up and brief today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I still, I still have a few college funds to pay for, Said. So. All right. Good afternoon. Um, the Secretary General. Secretary General arrived in Ulaanbaatar today, the capital of Mongolia. This is the second stop in during this uh, current trip. As you know, Mongolia is a nuclear-free zone and has also been an important interlocutor of the United Nations in relation to the situation on the Korean uh, Peninsula. The issue of the peninsula will come up in the discussions the Secretary General will have on this current trip. He will then go, of course, after Mongolia to the Republic of Korea. Earlier today in Tokyo, the Secretary General spoke to the media where he stressed that at a time when geopolitical tensions are rising and the nuclear threat is back in focus, nuclear armed countries need to commit to no first use of nuclear weapons and must never use, threaten, never use or threaten non-nuclear armed countries with the use of nuclear weapons. He also said that these requests will be taken um, he hopes that these requests will be taken seriously because we are witnessing a radicalization of the geopolitical situation that makes the risk of a nuclear war something we cannot completely forget. In addition, he urged Japan to take climate action by cutting emissions, stop funding coal plants abroad, and partner with countries to help them transition to renewable energy. And this afternoon, uh, before leaving uh, Tokyo, he met with Emperor Naruhito of Japan, and you will see that on Saturday he took part at the peace memorial ceremonies in Hiroshima. Uh, during his uh, message there, the Secretary General said his message to world leaders is simple. Stop flirting with disaster. Take the nuclear option off the table for good. All of the remarks from uh, this weekend and today were shared with you. Uh, turning to uh, the situation in the Middle East, the special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, Tor Venisland, who is in, um, in Jerusalem, is continuing to closely follow the implementation of last night's ceasefire agreement and commitments, including the opening of Gaza for humanitarian assistance. He will be briefing the Security Council um, at 3 p.m. today via video conference uh, to update council members on the latest developments. That will be an open meeting. We'll share his remarks with you as soon as uh, we can. The Deputy Special Coordinator Lynn Hastings entered Gaza uh, earlier this morning, leading the UN's uh, humanitarian response on the ground. She spent the day meeting with uh, our colleagues as well as other humanitarian agencies, families of people in, impacted by the escalation of violence, and civil society groups in order to begin assessing the damage and the needs in the aftermath of this current round of hostilities. Essential personnel for the UN Relief and Works Agency are continuing to work around the clock to monitor the situation and to ensure that the uh, delivery of UNRWA services continues unabated. Uh, the electricity situation in Gaza is improving, as we are told, and rolling daily power cuts are ex expected to decline from 20 to 14 hours a day. That's according to our colleagues in the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. For its part, the World Food Program is set to distribute cash assistance to 5,000 people in need. And as you saw last night, the Secretary General, in a statement, welcomed the announcement of a ceasefire. He said he was deeply saddened by the loss of life and injuries, including children from airstrikes in Gaza and indiscriminate, ro indiscriminate firing of rockets towards Israel from population centers in Gaza by Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other militant groups. The Secretary General calls on all sides to observe the ceasefire, and he reaffirms the United Nations' commitment to the achievement of a two-state solution based on relevant UN resolutions, international law, and prior agreements, and the importance of restoring a political horizon. Um, turning to Ukraine, we, along with our humanitarian partners, have today released a revised humanitarian flash appeal. The financial requirements have increased from $2.25 billion to $4.3 
$1.5 billion. More than a quarter of Ukraine's population, that's 17.7 million men, women, and children, will need humanitarian assistance in the months ahead. That's an increase of about 2 million compared to our estimates in April. Uh, the appeal has been extended until December due to the worsening situation. Um, with $2.38 billion already received towards the flash appeal, donor support to this emergency has been unprecedented. The humanitarian coordinator uh, for Ukraine, Denise Brown, has called on the international community to continue supporting our life-saving operations. Our humanitarian colleagues warn that during the forthcoming winter, the situation can deteriorate as more people will be displaced from areas with limited access to gas, fuel, or electricity. Supporting them is a priority. During the first five months of the war, at least 2.3 million Ukrainians received cash assistance. We're also planning to scale up uh, to a target of 6.3 million vulnerable people by the end of the year. Denise Brown stressed that aid groups in Ukraine will need safe and unimpeded access to all war-impacted areas. Since the beginning of the war, access has been extremely challenging in areas beyond the control of the government of Ukraine. She called on the parties to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. We've also been sharing with you the regular updates uh, from our colleagues at the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative Joint Coordination Center on the movement of ships uh, out in and out of the Black Sea. Um, turning to Chad, the Secretary General addressed by recorded video message the signing ceremony of the Doha peace agreement between the Chadian transitional authorities and political military groups. He thanked the state of Qatar for hosting the Doha pre-dialogue and commended the Chadian parties for their effect efforts in the pursuit of peace, which are bearing fruit today. The Secretary General said he hopes that the Doha peace agreement will enable the participation of signatory groups in the national dialogue alongside men and women from all walks of life. He noted that the national dialogue um, will provide a historic opportunity to put Chad on the path towards constitutional order and sustainable peace, and he encourages further uh, engagements with the groups that have not yet signed ahead of the national dialogue to facilitate their participation in the inclusive na national dialogue in N'Djamena, the capital of Chad. Uh, going slightly west uh, to Mali, uh, you will have seen that in a statement we issued on Friday afternoon, the Secretary General and the Chairperson of the African Union uh, Commission, uh, Mr. Faki, welcomed the successful conclusion of the decision-making meeting on certain aspects of the agreement on peace and reconciliation resulting from the Algiers process. They, are particularly acknowledge, uh, they particularly acknowledge the consensus reached by the parties of the integration of 26,000 ex-combatants into the defense forces and other state services, as well as institutional reforms not related to the review of the Constitution. That full statement is online. And uh, I have a rather detailed humanitarian update for you from Ethiopia, which uh, we have not heard from in, in some time. Our humanitarian colleagues continue to provide critical assistance to millions of people across the country, which is facing the worst drought in the past 40 years. More than 16 million people are now targeted for assistance as worsening levels of malnutrition are reported, and more than 3.5 million livestock have died. In the first half of this year, over 13 million men, women, and children received humanitarian assistance in drought-infected areas, including more than 7 million people receiving food aid. Our humanitarian colleagues inform us that across Somalia, northern Kenya, and southern and south, southern and eastern Ethiopia, more than 21 million people are already facing high levels of acute food insecurity following four consecutive failing rainy seasons. The failure of a fifth rainy season this autumn is also likely, according to experts. At the same time, parts of Ethiopia face a risk of flooding in the coming weeks, and more than 1.7 million people are likely to be impacted. In northern Ethiopia, humanitarian deliveries continue in the Tigray region, but our ability to distribute it has been limited by shortages of fuel and of cash. In a positive development, 12 tankers carrying 600,000 liters of fuel arrived on, uh, in Tigray on August 3rd, that's a few days ago. 
However, our partners estimate that about 2 million liters of fuel are needed each month to sustain humanitarian operations. In another positive development, humanitarian food assistance is being distributed in three hard-to-reach districts of Amhara Wag Hamra zone for the first time in over one year. A convoy with food for about 30,000 people got into the area at the end of July. Delivery of additional assistance, including nutrition and health supplies, is being planned. For its part, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization today said that it is scaling up the urgent procurement of fertilizers to help farmers in Tigray sow their fields in the midst of a critical planting season. This is thanks to a $10 million loan received, approved by the UN Central Emergency Response Fund. Moving south to the Central African Republic, a quick update from our peacekeepers there. Uh, the peacekeeping mission reports that it has supported a community violence reduction program titled Tena de Tena, or Hand in Hand. The program has helped create socioeconomic incentives and livelihoods for 52 beneficiaries, including ex combatants and violence-prone youth in the city of Bria in Otkoto Prefecture. Um, and uh, moving to back to, the, to this hemisphere, you have seen reports of a major fire in the province of Batanza in Cuba. Our colleagues on the ground tell us the situation has worsened in the last few hours due to the collapse and explosion of two fuel tanks. Local authorities uh, tell us that 4,000 people have been evacuated, although the highest concentration of pollutants in the area close to the fire, uh, with a chance that it may spread. I can tell you that the Secretary General joins the UN team in Cuba under the leadership of Resident Coordinator Consuelo Vidal in expressing his condolences and utmost solidarity with the people and government of Cuba. Our team on the ground extends, uh, is extending their support to the government and are following the situation closely. Um, and we know the authorities have been working around the clock to try to put out the fire. And uh, I was asked about the inauguration of President Gustavo Petro in Colombia, and I can tell you that the Secretary General congratulates President Petro on his inauguration and welcomes the President's commitments to deepen and expand peace, to promote and protect human rights and gender equality, foster inclusive de development, safeguard the environment, and contribute to the fight against climate change. He extends the strong support of the United Nations as the new administration takes on these key challenges and for its effort to comprehensively implement the final peace agreement and carry out a policy of, quote, total peace that includes the regions that have suffered the most in Colombia's armed conflict. And lastly, um, in Sri Lanka, the UN Population Fund today launched an appeal of $10.7 million to deliver life-saving health care to more than 2 million women and girls in the country, in Sri Lanka, in the next six months. UNFPA notes that the country is experiencing its worst socioeconomic crisis since independence, and its once robust health system is teetering on the edge of collapse amidst debilitating power shortages and lack of critical supplies, equipment, and medicine. Edie, get ready. Let me read this first. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, um. Thank you, Steph. Um, one clarification on Ukraine uh, first. On the $4.3 billion that uh, the UN is now seeking, uh, what period does that cover? What time? That covers from now until December. So it doesn't include the rest of the winter? Uh, no, no, it's now until uh, until December. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we will, given that this is an ongoing conflict, uh, things will need to be reassessed regularly. Okay. Uh, secondly, does the Secretary General have any comment on China's decision to extend its military exercises around Taiwan? Yeah, I would refer you to what he said a few hours ago in Tokyo. Uh, on, the, on that situation. So, I mean, that, his, his position has not changed. And that was in the transcript we sent out. And does the Secretary General have any comment on Kenya's elections today where there have already been a few issues? Uh, on Kenya, uh, you, bless you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I mean, it goes without saying that I, I think the, the, the elections that will take place uh, tomorrow will be an important milestone in the country's democratic process. Uh, we're obviously following the developments there very closely, uh, both from the Secretary General's standpoint and our staff in, uh, in Kenya. We hope that the polling uh, and the vote will take place in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere of, um, of peace and that they'll be free and, and fair, obviously. Uh, we have been providing some support uh, to the national, to national stakeholders' efforts towards voter, edu voter education and conflict prevention. Linda. <clears throat> Thank you, Steph. Um, this is also regarding the Ukraine appeal. I would, I, I'm, shall I say the unprecedented response mm -hmm. to the Ukrainian appeal? I was just wondering which countries were the major donors, and also in general the broader contributions. How many countries actually participated? Uh, most of the 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 um, most of the donors have been from Western. Uh, we are to speak UN terms from Western uh, from Western Europe. Uh, I would urge you to look at the OCHA website because of all the appeals are fairly transparent. They list the countries and the, and the and the donations. I, I would like to add that we are extremely grateful for the generosity of donors to our Ukraine appeal, but also we would want to see that generosity applied across the board. I mean, day after day here, we talk about all these these heartbreaking humanitarian situations uh, and we'll say that the appeal is 15 percent funded 20 percent funded um, we know that donors are stretched we urge those donors who give to give more those who may not be traditional donors to also give uh, but there is a there is a need for cash across the board for humanitarian appeals just, just to follow up Given all of these appeals, is there uh, sort of an overall amount in terms of, you know, total amount of these There appeals? is an overall amount. Uh, it is just not in my head currently, but it is on the OCHA website. That's why it was, if to some and then we could have said. Uh, thanks, Steph. I want to go back to the Middle East um, and first to the statement that uh, Mr. Winsland issued a uh, few hours after the beginning of the Israeli strikes. Uh, it was uh, notable that he didn't mention uh, that the fact that this uh, whole uh, conflict started by unprovoked strikes uh, by the Israeli army, something he does usually during his Security Council uh, statements, uh, monthly statements, when any uh, strike uh, when Israel uh, strikes Palestinians uh, or Gaza, and he then sometimes said that it came as uh, ret retaliation or answer, etc. So why uh, we didn't hear about that first? Look, I, I'm I'm not going to go into a post-game analysis of his of his statements. Uh, I think he will uh, he will address. Uh, the Security Council uh, in a few hours. I think his position will be made clear. He'll be representing the SG's uh, thinking on that. Our focus, I know his focus, uh, was on trying to get a ceasefire. He worked hand in hand notably with with Egypt and other uh, and other players to try to get that. Uh, he was uh, away from Jerusalem and then arrived back. Uh, yes, what day is today? Monday? Yes, he arrived back uh, Sunday, and I know he's been had been working the phones from abroad and was seeing a number of interlocutors. I have just a quick follow up also on your statement yesterday uh, that you issued, uh, uh, and it was a notable uh, few things. First of all, uh, there were uh, Palestinian civilians who were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about that the security uh, secretary general is saddened by uh, the killing of. You don't mention even that the Palestinians. You talk about children in Gaza. And then also, there is no condemnation for killing civilians. Uh, and um, the, the whole um, statement doesn't even uh, talk about the fact that Israel is attacking uh, Gaza. You, you talk about the uh, Islamic Jihad uh, using what you call population centers. Did you have investigations for that? What is, where did you base your, um, 
this the, the statement on uh, regarding the uh, that the Islamic Jihad using population centers? Well, I mean, we we based it on what we know. Uh, I, I don't really. I, again, it's it's hard for me to. I, I don't want to go into analysis of the statement. The statement speaks for itself. You're all welcome, and that is your your responsibility to analyze it and take it apart. We use the words that we used, uh, and we based it on the facts that we know. Sorry, but why there is no condemnation for killing civilians? I think we've been very clear. Uh, we, we've been very clear on all these issues in past statements, and we continue will to do so. Said. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Is the Secretary General content just to welcome a ceasefire when it happens for the, before the next round? You know, right after dozens of Palestinians have died. A lot of them are children. I mean, we began this session by talking about honor. Why not do the honorable thing and call for an end of the siege of Gaza that has gone on for 15 years. I, I, Why can't you call to end it I, I think now? We've, been very clear, we've been very clear on that. He's not content with just a ceasefire. And if you mm -hmm. see uh, at the end of the statement for him, it's about also ensuring that there's a political horizon. I mean, you know, it's, we're, uh, unless there are real political engagement, unless there's a political uh, horizon, uh, we will go from crisis to crisis, um, and that's his, uh, that's his message. Well, you're, uh, as the ultimate guarantor of human rights and so on, this organization, why can't say, what they say, this seed must stop today? What would prevent you from that? But we have, you we take have the called, high moral we, we have, we have say, called, uh, to, uh, do you call it we today? have called for Can the opening of Gaza. We have, right? we have done so, we've called for uh, the, the opening of Gaza so that uh, all humanitarian goods can come in so that people can go and 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 and, and go to their to their jobs uh, so that economic life so that life can can become bearable uh, for the people of Gaza. I have two more questions. One on Safriyatta. We are on what? Masafriyatta, an area where Israel is is, is uh, 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 it's it's imminent almost uh, ready to uh, evict hundreds of Palestinians from their home so they can turn it into a free fire zone. Do you have any position on that? Uh, let, me is, in, I, in let me look into that particular Hebron. situation. I'm I mean, sure we've, okay, I mean, okay. let me look into One that. last thing. There's also an announcement to build 1,400, 1400 um, settlement units today. Would you call on the Israelis not to do so? I mean, listen, I, I will wait for a particular announcement to comment on it, but I think we have been very clear on the illegality of, uh, of the settlements. And we have um, said that over and over again. And we continue to, we will continue to say publicly, and we'll continue to convey that privately. Okay. Sir. Hi, Steph. I have several questions on Ukraine. First, on the uh, Black Sea Grain mm -hmm. Initiative. Uh, the, first, the first ship, Razoni, uh, should have arrived in Tripoli uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. but it's it got delayed. Mm -hmm. Do you know the particular reason why? And today, the embassy of Ukraine in Lebanon said, since this this ship got delayed, the original buyer has decided not to buy the 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 the, the corn on mm -hmm. uh, on board. So, any comments on that? Look, the the this shipping. Uh, the, sh the shipping uh, on the on the Ukrainian side of it, the the issue of getting uh, Russian uh, grain and Russian uh, fertilizer back out to market, is our private sector dealings. It's a private sector ecosystem. Uh, what we've been told by uh, by shipping experts that it's not uncommon uh, for commercial vessels to change destinations. Uh, for cargo to be sold and resold while it's already on en route. Uh, that is not something that we're controlling. Uh, that is not something that we're, those are not decisions we're involved in. Those are private sector decisions. I think what is important, and, and this is what we're already seeing, of the, the combination of the package deal is the lowering of price on the global market of food of grain, uh, whether it's for humans, whether it's for animals. And, and that's the ultimate goal of what the Secretary General put out, uh, 
the ultimate goal of the Secretary General's effort in this in this regard. Um, the countries, you know, I, I think Rebecca Greenspan said this. Countries are not the ones who are buying grain. It's all done through the commercial sector. So the the lowering of prices is a good thing because it makes uh, it makes the food of price at least at the at the wholesale market uh, lower. We hope that this will trickle down to the retail as well because that's extremely important. And of course, it lowers the price for uh, an organization like World Food Program, which buys grain uh, on the open market. So there's no, re no, no uh, political interference in this, right? There is zero interference from the UN uh, or any other player for that that I know of um, on where these ships will go to. These are commercial decisions. These are all commercial ships. We do have a World Food Program ship that is supposed to go um, uh, to go in uh, to Ukraine and went into the, to the Black Sea ports of Ukraine. Once that happens, uh, we'll update you. Um, but these are commercial decisions. It's, it's, an, it's an open market. What we're pleased with is to see, I mean, and I think the, the FAO representative was very clear on that on Friday, is the, the, the wholesale price going down. And the second question is concerning Zaporizhia uh, mm -hmm. nuclear plant, because since last week we saw the, an escalation on that nuclear plant, and the Russian and the Ukrainian side, they both accuse each other of uh, shelling the nuclear plant and make it a very dangerous place. Uh, place. Um, and today the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia said that um, the IAEA boss, um, I mean Mr. Grossi, is intended to visit this nuclear plant, and she hopes that the UN wouldn't set up any interference on the, the IAS visit. So I just want to know first, do you have any knowledge about who really attacked the nuclear plant? And second, will the UN facilitate IAEA to make this visit come true? A, a couple of points. Uh, this notion that the United Nations has stood in the way of an IEA visit to Zaporizhia is frankly ridiculous. The Secretary General has been working hand in glove with the IEA and is supporting them uh, in whatever way we can. And again, I would refer you to what he said at the press conference in, um, in Tokyo uh, about 10, 10 hours ago or so, and he was very clear on that. It is, we're also extremely concerned about the situation around the plant. Um, that it could be uh, it could be attacked, um, that it could be used as a source of, uh, of of attacks, and we very much hope that the IEA will be able to send uh, tech, uh, you know, inspectors and people in to, to go look at what is going on in the plant. Thank I'm you, sorry, Stephen. Sorry, Chris I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, two questions on Palestine. Uh, first, on Gaza. After the UN finished the assessment of the damage, uh, will there be any emergency plan to provide aid to the families and people who impacted by this? Yes, I mean, we were already doing so. I think the World Food Program is already providing cash assistance uh, to a number of uh, families, I think 5,000. Um, so that's why Lynn is going in. We, we very much hope this uh, ceasefire will, um, uh, will hold. Um, and that we hope that humanitarian goods will be able to flow uh, in Gaza without any hindrance. Um, and we also very much hope that there will be increased, number, increased uh, fuel deliveries uh, for the power plant, which is, goes without saying so critical. Yeah. Under the protection of Israeli police, do you have any comment on that? Our, our position remains the same, is that we, uh, we are firm believers in the status quo uh, around the holy sites in Jerusalem and call on e everyone to avoid any provocative action. Ms. Salome, and then we'll go to Grigory. A um, couple points of clarification. Ukraine, two billion more needed, and that doesn't include, just to be clear, additional funding needed in other responses as a result of the conflict as well, right? I no, no, this is you, 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 yeah, humanitarian for. for Ukraine, yeah. And in Gaza, given that you said there is some improvement to the power cuts only 
14 hours a day instead of 20 and so on. Is it still considered a humanitarian emergency? And I guess it's too soon to have yes. a funding amount. Yes. Yet, I mean, still. Gaza, I think, was a humanitarian emergency before this latest escalation and continues to be. So the Secretary General, um, uh, just to clarify, the United States and the United Kingdom said that Israel had a right to defend itself. Um, the special rapporteur for the Palestinians said that actually uh, there was it, it could be an illegal response. I'm just wondering if the Secretary General will take a position on that. Is it? I, mean, I, I would. Um, given how, from an international law standpoint, how is it different from what Russia said they did in attacking a daycare center? They said they were going after munitions nearby. What's, is there a difference in the Secretary General's point of view between what Israel has done and what Russia has done? Yeah, I'm not going to do a compare and contrast of the two situations. I would refer you to the statement that he put out, and I would also ask, beg for your patience, um, and wait for Mr. Venisland uh, to give you the final update in about an hour, two hours and ten minutes. Does, she support, does he support the call for an investigation that she has called for, and even the United States has said that I think there should any, be investigation uh, of the any, child who was Any killed. situation where we see deaths of civilians need to be fully investigated. Gregory. Thank you very much, Stefan. I, I just to follow up uh, with Zaporozhsky power plant. And so uh, uh, due, due to the procedures that all of the visit of atomic agency uh, should, must coordinate with UN secretariat, so do you have any any dates of this kind of visits? No, I mean, the, the, the IEA is leading the discussions with the parties on uh, on the accessing of the plant. And again, uh, we will be supportive in any way we can uh, so we get that visit. I mean, I think the Secretary General was very uh, clear when he said we fully support the IEA and their efforts in relation to creating the conditions of stabilization of the plant. Um, and then he hopes they get access soon. And I think the quote that he used uh, in Tokyo was that any attack on a nuclear plant is, quote, suicidal. OK. Uh, welcome back, Polina Kubiak. We hope just you know, we're trying to line up a briefing here Thursday by someone from the Joint Coordination Center in Istanbul. Oh, sorry, if the, I'm sorry, there are two questions online. I'm sorry. Uh, Iftikhar and then um, Mushfik. Iftikhar, please. Okay, thank you, Steph. <coughs> there are press reports that the government of Pakistan has asked for uh, United Nations assistance in dealing with the devastating floods uh, across Pakistan. Uh, is there any UN response to the appeal? Uh, I will check with our country office in Pakistan, but I can tell you we are, of course, ready and willing to assist uh, the government people in Pakistan in any way uh, we are able to. Um, Bushvik, please. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Bangladesh government declared the country's police, name, police chief name to attend the United Nations Police Chief Summit. As you know, the, the country's police chief, Benzir Ahmed, his United States imposed on sanction uh, for serious human rights abuse. Both the Treasury Department and the Department of State imposed sanction on him. So I'm wondering how he gets the invitation and how he will be able to attend because United States imposed sanction on him for the serious uh, abuse of human rights. Thank you. Uh, I mean, two, two things here. One, uh, each member state is free uh, to nominate whomever they want to represent them at, at, a UN, uh, at a UN meeting. It's not for us to decide. And on the issue of access and visa, um, that is a question to ask uh, the permanent mission of the U.S. Uh, here because they are the ones granting uh, the visas. Ms. Kubiak, take two. Thank you. Up, 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 up. 